keep this box of products of concern. Sometimes the labels are so small it helps to have a magnifying glass present. Restore beautiful length smoothing balm. See, these are impossible. You can never see what's in here. Oh, herbal essence. So this is this is <laughs> this is a personal favorite. I think I used to use this back when I was in high school with passion flower, heather, and bay laurel in mountain spring water. Let's hope this is just as good as it sounds. Ah, acrylamide. Ethyl methacrylate, which is another chemical of concern. It's interesting because it's usually found in nail polish. Lead is probably holds the gold standard for being one of the most toxic chemicals on the planet. Um, just a horrible neurotoxin causes brain damage accumulates in your body. Once it's there, it stays forever. Bad news. The label of fragrance can hide dozens of secret toxic chemicals. All these products always have propylene glycol, which is antifreeze. And not everyone wants antifreeze in their um, cosmetic products. This is funny because this one sounds like so healthy. Eucalyptus, oatmeal extract, citrus, orange peel, DMDM hydantoin, uh, formaldehyde releasing chemical. It's a human carcinogen. So, you know, some good, but not all. Mr. Chairman, the laws governing the safety of personal care products, which every American uses every day, have not been really updated since 1938. Hair tonic. It prevents dryness, keeps the most stubborn hair in place without grease. There is increasing evidence that certain ingredients in personal care products are linked to a range of health concerns, ranging from reproductive issues, such as fertility problems and miscarriage, to cancer. New Mist Green Camé contains a special protective ingredient, CT3. Keeps you shower sweet all day. Tonight and tomorrow your hair will be sunshine bright. Personal care product safety needs to be taken seriously. Soap is probably one of the oldest formulations, oldest chemical reactions known to humankind. Um, you know, if you look back in the day, probably cavemen discovered fire, maybe discovered bread, and then discovered soap. Cooking over fire and the, the oils from the meat would drip into the ashes, and the ash contains alkali. Alkali plus oil equals soap, glycerin, and water. So one of the most simple closed reactions you can think of. In the Nablus region of Palestine, they made soaps, they still make them today, out of vegetable oils. That technology got transferred to the Castile region of Spain, where Castile soaps were made from olive oil. And you can make soap out of any oil. We use vegetable oils, but you can make soap out of petrochemicals as well, as is often the case.
The Food, Drug, and Cosmetics Act gives the FDA its authority for the regulation of cosmetics. Under the Act, a cosmetic is an article that is sprinkled, poured, introduced, rubbed on to impart beauty, improve the appearance, for cleansing. If the structure or function is affected, then it becomes a drug. in the post-war years, you had companies all over America basically trying to use some of the efficiencies they had learned in the war with all the chemical advancement that had been made and kind of apply those to peaceful times. The mantra of the day was better living through chemistry, which was actually what DuPont's slogan was. And the idea that you can improve nature and make it better through the laboratory. Say, didn't you just wash those curtains this morning? Yes, but they're made with day crumbs. That's why they dry so quickly. The cosmetics and personal care products industry really seized upon the laboratory creation of these synthetic chemicals for use in, in consumer products. Using natural oils is expensive. There's all these uh, byproducts of refining petroleum, and so why not use artificial detergent to make cleaners cheaper? There's a lot of opportunity for brands to make money if they create specialized products, whether it's you know for oily hair or curly hair or shiny hair. It's away from what might have originally been a relatively simple set of shampoos and soap, say, early in the 1900s. Companies would test various chemicals to see if they had a benefit, if they made the moisturizer smoother, uh, did it wash off easily, all those kinds of efficacy questions were at the forefront of the development of this industry. Too, because every girl who's been using drying soaps or greasy creams to clean her face should certainly know about they remove the deep poor dirt and makeup soaps and creams leave behind. That introduction of new chemicals has not always been well supervised. The companies were only testing the chemicals themselves for short-term adverse health effects eye irritation or rashes. They weren't looking at the long-term adverse health effects related to those chemicals. Because Dial contains hexachlorophene, there's nothing else as good. Fresh clearness of your skin is continuously protected. All of these products were formulated to basically serve a purpose. They weren't trying to cause long-term harm. They were just trying to formulate great products. We have these increases in diseases that we can't explain by evolution alone. In the 1940s, a woman's lifetime risk of breast cancer was 1 in 20. Today, it's 1 in 8. Striking increases in childhood brain cancer, in autism, uh, immune system disorders. We're seeing the numbers of disease increase in a direct relationship to the introduction of chemicals in commerce. FDA has clear authority to regulate the safety of these products under the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, which requires that every product and its individual ingredients be substantiated for safety before they are put on the market and that the labeling of those products be truthful and not misleading. I'm the director for the Office of Cosmetics and Colors at the Food and Drug Administration. My office is responsible for the regulation of cosmetics in the United States. Under the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, the cosmetics that you see in the marketplace, no one has to come to us to show us data beforehand. Manufacturers are supposed to substantiate the safety of their ingredients and products before they go to marketplace. Um, the FDA does not dictate how that gets done. Um, most manufacturers will actually do studies themselves, uh, either clinical types of trials, they may do animal testing, or they may do in vitro studies. What they do and how they do it, really as long as it's validated, the FDA does not dictate. But again, we do not review that data. 
Fundamentally, there are no requirements or next to no requirements to bring a, a personal care product to the marketplace, get it on the shelf in your grocery store or your drugstore. The government has no list of studies that must be performed. Once you've added a bunch of ingredients together to make a product, there's no requirement by the government that you test the final product either. So you can put almost anything into a personal care product. You have to list it on the label by law but what you can list amounts to a list of thousands of possible ingredients. I'm president of Environmental Working Group. EWG is a nonprofit environmental research and advocacy organization. Some years ago, we built a database that allowed us to look across all of the personal care products we could find information for, and we look at the evidence out there that scientists have established in the open literature so that we can type in the names of the ingredients or the name of the product and up will pop a rating on the basis of, of health and safety of ingredients and products. It's important that the labeling be accurate so that consumers will understand how to use the product to be able to use it safely. The FDA has the authority to, to require ingredient disclosure of the, the chemicals in cosmetics. Ingredient disclosure is required except for the chemicals in fragrance. Um, that is, <laughs> that's really, that's really about it. And I'm the Director of Program and Policy at the Breast Cancer Fund, and I'm also the co-founder and director of the Campaign for Safe Cosmetics. When we say cosmetics, we're talking about shampoo, hair conditioner, body lotion, toothpaste, deodorant, etc. Everyone uses them. There are right now over 10,000 chemicals, industrial chemicals used to formulate cosmetics. We're talking about chemicals like formaldehyde, triclosan, phthalates, parabens. I mean, the list really goes on and on. Cocomite DEA, MEA or TEA can be found in baby bath products like bubble bath, in uh, shampoos, in men's products like shaving cream, and in cleansers. It's used in a cosmetic product to cause foam. Cocomite DEA was just listed recently by California's Prop 65 program as a carcinogen. Toluene creates a smooth finish in nail polish. It's also used in some hair dyes. There's a lot of science arguing the relationship between toluene and reproductive toxicity. Lead is prohibited by the European Union, but it's in men's hair dye. Lead is a very powerful neurotoxin that causes brain damage. It is a company's clear responsibility to ensure that its products comply with the law and that the current law provides penalties for manufacturers that do not meet these standards. Safety is the top priority for our industry. With careful and thorough scientific research and development serving as the foundation for everything that we do. Brazilian Blowout. It's a hair straightening product that was found to contain more than 10% by weight formaldehyde. Formaldehyde is a known human carcinogen. The kind of ironic part is the product was being marketed as formaldehyde free. We received complaints about Brazilian Blowout. These products were labeled as being formaldehyde free. But in fact, the presence of the methylene glycol, when you actually heat the product to smooth or straighten the hair, a formaldehyde gets released into the air. The presence of the formaldehyde becomes a safety issue for consumers exposed to it. When there is contaminated food, the FDA issues a recall. When, you know, there was, the t um, Tylenol was found to be um, contaminated, the FDA issued a recall. That's not the case for cosmetic products. The FDA does not have mandatory recall authority for a cosmetic. What that means is that if it looks like a product should be recalled, we can work with the manufacturer to request a recall. What the FDA can do and does do, and it's, it's kind of laughable, is they write the company a letter. In 2011, the FDA issued its first letter um, regarding Brazilian blowout. They were supposed to change the labeling 
so that the labeling was consistent with what's in the product and that there were adequate warnings for consumers to be able to use the product safely. But they didn't have to remove the formaldehyde? They did not have to remove the formaldehyde. The FDA couldn't do anything about the problem. The company was sued by the California Attorney General for misbranding, um, so they did remove the false marketing claim that it was formaldehyde-free, but those products remain on the shelves today. The product does exist on the market, whether or not there are, have been changes as a result of the warning letters. Beyond that, I really can't discuss since we're still going back, and we're still under the investigation phase or discussions with the company itself. Formaldehyde is widely used in both personal care products and makeup here in the United States. Formaldehyde does exist in other products. It's usually in a lower dose, and it's usually in such a way that the exposure is minimal. Typically, there are chemicals added to these products. They're called formaldehyde donors that release formaldehyde to preserve the finished product itself. Bubble bath, to shampoo, to conditioners, to makeup itself. The foundation of a science-based safety assessment is that any ingredient has a safe range and an unsafe range, whether it's water, a vitamin, or a newly discovered compound. An ingredient safe range is defined, is defined through many studies before it can be used in a product. Safety is about choosing ingredients that can be used well within their safe range and avoiding ingredients that cannot. Companies often make the point that the doses we may be exposed to in a personal care product are so low that they hardly matter. And they say, of course, the dose makes the poison, which is a ages-old precept in toxicology, and to a degree, it's true. There's several different examples where, you know, there's really no debate that it's a bad actor chemical at issue. There's still a debate about whether there's enough of it there to probably cause serious health risk. That's a difficult and complex thing to figure out and it becomes ever even more complicated when you think about the number of products that you're exposed to that contain similar chemicals or that contain chemicals that uh, interact with the same biological mechanism that might be important for a disease state. We've done studies where we've looked at teenage girls and tracked what kinds of personal care products they use and then tested their blood afterwards and we found lots of the breakdown products and actual chemicals from the cosmetics so we know it gets into their bodies. What we don't know is what health problems might be related to the combinations of chemicals. We live in a, a chemical stew. The air we breathe, the food we eat, the personal care products put all kinds of chemicals into our bodies. There's no regulatory agency that tests the combination of chemicals that we actually encounter in the real world. We have this chemical mixture that we really don't understand the health consequences of. Cosmetic safety assessments are thorough, addressing numerous health questions, including but not limited to the potential for cancer, reproductive harm, and allergic reactions. It is staggering how many of these chemicals end up being detectable in a large proportion of the human population. I'm talking about 85 or 90% of the U.S. population with very little understanding of how much their biological systems can take before some kind of adverse health effects happen. I'm a toxicologist by training and I'm primarily responsible for doing the research that underlies Good Guide. Good Guide was founded by a professor at UC Berkeley who was trying to answer the same kind of questions that most consumers are. Is it okay to put this shampoo on his young kids? And realized it took basically a doctoral dissertation to figure out, you know, is this product safe or not? The mission of Good Guide since then has basically been to get consumers information about the chemical composition of the products that they're buying, as well as the sort of social and environmental performance of the brands that make those products. Lots of chemicals can cause adverse health effects. Um, in almost all cases, reproductive toxicity, developmental toxicity, neurotoxicity, it does make sense to pay attention to dose makes the poison. You need to be exposed to more than a specific amount 
for there to re really be a health risk. There are some exceptions to that. The general thinking about carcinogens is that there is no safe level of exposure. And all it would take would be a single molecular interaction to uh, potentially uh, flip a switch in a cell, causing cancer either in animals or in humans. Changes in toxicological understanding, particularly in the last 10 years, Whereas, like I said, the presumption has always been it's only carcinogens that r you really need to worry about down to the lowest dose. Um, you know, the case is now being made that there are other types of adverse health effects, particularly endocrine disruption, um, that don't also that do not exhibit traditional thresholds. And so you may need to be concerned about very low levels of exposure. I'm a reproductive epidemiologist. I study the effect of chemicals in the environment and how that impacts women's reproductive health and the health and development of their children. An endocrine disruptor or a hormone disruptor is a chemical that mimics or blocks or otherwise interferes with the natural hormones in our bodies. So these chemicals could act like estrogens, um, or like androgens, which are the male hormones like testosterone, or other um, hormones like thyroid hormone. Traditionally in toxicology, the idea has been that the dose makes the poison and that the bigger the dose that you have, the um, more the effect is on the body. And when we look at endocrine disruptors, that's not necessarily true. The hormones in our body act on a very, very small level, on a parts per billion level. There's evidence with certain endocrine disrupting chemicals, the very small levels that are more on the level of what the hormones in our bodies act on might be the ones that would trigger a biological effect. Hormone disrupting chemicals that are found in personal care products include triclosan, which is an antibacterial, an antimicrobial that's found commonly in liquid soaps. Triclosan is also found in one brand of toothpaste. What we know about triclosan is that in animal studies, it seems to impact thyroid hormone levels. Thyroid hormone is very important during pregnancy for brain development. It also appears that in animal studies, triclosan may have anti-estrogen properties and anti-androgen or anti-testosterone properties. But in terms of human studies, we don't really know um, what the health effects of triclosan may be. Parabens are preservatives that are used in makeup and other personal care products to prevent the growth of mold and bacteria. Parabens have been found in breast cancer tissue, and parabens have also been shown to make breast cancer cells proliferate. So that's indicative of an estrogenic mechanism. But really, in terms of how they affect human health, we don't know very much at this point. Phthalates are the chemical that's in personal care products that we know the most about in terms of the endocrine disruptors. Phthalates can be found in plastics, um, but they also can be found in fragrances and nail polish. Fragrance is used in, in many, many different personal care products, so it's not just your cologne or your perfume. Um, it can be, they can be used in, in soaps and shampoos and conditioners. Phthalates are a demonstrated anti-androgen, meaning that they block the effects of testosterone and other male hormones. They they also appear to have weak estrogenic effects. So you're seeing a blocking of testosterone and also a, a mimicking of estrogen. We're seeing in the human research now associations with greater risk of obesity, greater risk of allergies and asthma, and um, neurodevelopmental problems and behavioral problems associated with early life phthalate exposure. In 2014, we published a study showing associations between levels of phthalates in children's bodies and suggestive associations with um, combinations of, of learning disabilities and, and ADHD-type behaviors. There have been several other studies also that have now shown associated with later behavior problems and later cognitive problems. Aggression and inattention and decrements in mental development there's some human studies with mother's exposure during pregnancy that show reproductive birth defects, cryptorchidism, which is undescended testes, and hypospadia, which is a misplaced opening of the urethra. There's also a way to just sort of look at um, hormone exposure in utero um, just by different measurements in the genital area that indicate a more feminized or more masculinized um, in utero environment. So those are one of the things that's been shown in studies. In adult men, there are studies looking at how long it takes for a man's partner to become pregnant and what the, the man's sperm count and sperm quality is like. 
One of the things that we're seeing around the world is sperm counts seem to be decreasing, testicular cancer seems to be increasing, and the incidence of these birth defects, cryptorchidism, which is undescended testes, and hypospadia, which is a misplaced opening of the urethra, seem to be increasing sort of around the world in North America and Europe and other countries. Whether these uh, trends can be attributed to chemical exposure or to endocrine disruptor exposure or to chemicals in our personal care products, you know, that's, that's a pretty open question. But I think there are real reasons to be concerned um, and to think that maybe exposure to estrogenic chemicals might be something that we would like to try to reduce or minimize. The thing about phthalates is that phthalates are not listed on the ingredient list. Often on the ingredient list it'll say uh, parfum or fragrance. Often those fragrances contain phthalates, but as a consumer looking at the label, you don't know. The Fair Packaging and Labeling Act um, allows the manufacturer to list fragrance or flavor by itself. That if this is a trade secret or proprietary information, by simply saying fragrance or flavor, that's sufficient. If uh, phthalates are part of the fragrance or flavor, they do not need to be listed separately. We don't know what chemicals are going into products uh, to make them smell the way that they do. Until we know what those chemicals are, we can't start to figure out what the potential health effects are. There's very little information out there in the consumer marketplace about what's in the fragrance of any given product. The International Fragrance Association, they produce this list of like, you know, 3,000 uh, fragrance constituents, and it looks awful. There's some things on there that don't have health problems, but there's a lot of things in there that, that throw hazard signals. Phthalates have been the ones that have gotten the most attention, um, but there are other chemicals and fragrance, like the synthetic musks, for example, that have been even less studied. The reality is any fragrance house can reverse engineer the fragrance chemicals in another fragrance house's fragrance. So the only people kept in the dark, really, as to the chemicals that make up fragrance are consumers and the regulators themselves. For the Hermosa study, we looked at four chemicals, four endocrine disrupting chemicals that we knew we could measure in the body, that we know are in personal care products that we were concerned about. We wanted to find out how teenage girls are exposed to the chemicals that are in personal care products and in makeup. We gave them some alternate products, low chemical, alternative, more green personal care products. And what we found was that after using lower chemical products, girls could lower their levels of these chemicals by between 25 and 45 percent. And that was just with three days of changed behavior. We really saw correlations between what the girl was wearing the day that she came into our office and the levels of the chemicals that were in her body. Girls who wore more makeup had higher levels of, of certain chemicals in their bodies, and girls who uh, used certain kinds of toothpaste had higher levels of triclosan, for example, in their bodies. That suggests to us that these cosmetics really are the source of these chemicals, that by changing the products that you're using, you can change your exposure to these chemicals. Also, that the hormone disruptors that we're concerned about that are in personal care products, they don't stay in our bodies very long. It's a very sort of short-term exposure. Um, you know, these chemicals are detected in our bodies within hours of, you know, sort of putting lotion on or putting different products on our bodies. But then within 24, 48 hours, they've also been cleared from our bodies. What we've seen is, over the last few decades, big shifts in the chemicals that we're worried about. So a lot of people have heard of DDT, the pesticide, or PCBs um, that were used in electronics, and, and they were both um, banned in the 1970s. These were chemicals that once you were exposed and once they were in your body, they stayed in your body for decades. Now what we're looking at is sort of this new generation of hormone disrupting chemicals. They're not lodging in our vat in our body and staying there for decades, but even though we're clearing that exposure regularly, we're also reapplying that exposure. Sarah does her makeup really fast. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I got a She's quick, she knows. Um, I put mascara on. I use both of these. I did um, some foundation. I use this tinted pomade. It's more like a like a jelly type thing. It stays on longer. Some blush, concealer, some eyeshadow, powder for your eyebrows, and some eyeliner. This is primer. You put this on, 
to keep <laughs> this on. Eyebrow gel. These are all my eyeshadows that I use. Bronzer, blush. I finish it all with a finishing spray. Um, I don't really know what this does. I just know that <laughs> when I supposed to do <laughs> when I use it, it makes it look a little less cakey. So I go ahead and put that on. I'm not too brand conscious. Like this is a lot of my stuff is just drugstore brand, like Revlon, Maybelline, and all that jazz. Um, but if I know it's good and I've used it before, or when you use your friend stuff and you like, you're like, oh, yeah. I like this. Where'd you get it? Well, if your friends tell you, oh, this one makes my eyelashes really long and you can see it, you're like, wow, I'm going to buy that mascara next time. <laughs> Enhance your complexion with Hydra Touch Primer. It's infused with chamomile, green tea, and ginseng root extract to create the perfect canvas and give your skin a radiant boost. I don't know if it does all that, but... Does it have ingredients on the back? No. It just, it's made in South Korea. None of these say anything. It tells you what skin type it's like suitable for, but not anything else. I think you have to like look it up online or something, which nobody has time for. This one has ingredients. Yeah. First one's water, and then a whole bunch of other things I can't pronounce. Iso isodado cane, um, acrylates, polytrimethyl, methyl, siloximeth. Oh, that was good. Good job. It doesn't matter what's in it, usually. I mean, unless I know about it. Like, unless I know something is cancer-causing. Like, there's mm -hmm. a recall on something, and then I'm not going to buy it. But I what know. I think is if they're selling it in stores, then they, it has to go through some kind of regulation with the FDA. So I wouldn't... Like, I don't know. It's not something that would that I would feel the need to look up. Mm -hmm. you, know? you know? Well, there's a reason you take it off there's a reason the you, the Yeah, and you, they tell you not to sleep in it. If I knew that it was like gonna cause cancer, obviously I, I don't know. I don't. I have don't. To buy it. Yeah. I feel like there has to be labs and you know scientists and obviously they a lot of them test on animals. Um, there's probably studies with humans. You know, I I feel like they they have to they have to test their products on humans too once they determine that it's safe. Like I probably pay more attention to the ingredients that is in food than. I'd yeah. never looked at the back of this. Yeah. When the EU adopted the cosmetic standard that's in place today, other world governments started to take note as well. Canada instituted what they call the Canadian hot list. Japan started to get into the act and more strictly regulate cosmetic safety. The U.S. is the furthest behind. The European Union has banned or restricted over 1,300 chemicals from cosmetics or personal care products. The U.S. has only ever banned or restricted 11 chemicals from cosmetics. The European Union model, once a chemical is designated as having a sufficient level of hazard that it is truly a bad actor chemical, you need to make a very cogent case that that problematic chemical uh, is the only substance that can deliver a traditional functional benefit that's valuable in the market, and you've done everything you can to control the health risks from it. We don't have anything like that kind of, you know, authorization process, uh, either post-use or prior to use, to control the chemicals that we're seeing in consumer products. Congress has tried a number of times to introduce legislation to finally regulate personal care products in a modern way. Um, every single time it has failed. A lot of that has to do with the power of the cosmetic industry lobby. The Personal Care Products Council is the trade association for the mainstream cosmetics industry and they've done a really good job of, of insisting on self-regulation. The Personal Care Products Council represents 600 large, medium and small size companies that manufacture and distribute many of the most trusted brands in beauty and personal care. Our products are among the safest product categories regulated by the FDA. The trade association itself, the Personal Care Products Council, is incredibly powerful. And the industry itself, they contribute to members of Congress. 
In the early 1970s, Senator Eagleton was getting ready to introduce a, a bill to more strictly regulate the cosmetics industry, and they said, we will create our own self-policing um, safety um, panel called the Cosmetic Ingredient Review, and they will review the safety of cosmetic ingredients. For 40 years, the CIR has reviewed the safety of cosmetic ingredients in the United States, and our mission to protect consumers remains strong. Public safety is our major con consideration. The cosmetic ingredient review system is uh, funded by the cosmetic industry. The scientists who do the reviews are hired by the industry, and the organization itself is based inside the trade association for the cosmetics industry. As of June 2015, the CIR expert panel has reviewed more than 4,000 cosmetic ingredients, classifying them as fouls. Safe as use, safe with certain use restrictions, unsafe for use in cosmetics, or insufficient data available to assess safety of use in cosmetics. Approximately 95% of the ingredients reviewed were considered safe as used or safe with use restrictions. A portion of those ingredients were not deemed safe until additional data was provided. Less than one half of 1% were considered unsafe for use. The Personal Care Products Council will bring out their own scientists or their own science to try to argue the safety of a cosmetic chemical when authoritative scientific bodies from around the world say that it's not safe. And then the policymakers get confused and throw up their hands and say, you know, we don't want to tackle this problem if there's, if there's disagreement around the science. Even if they wanted to, the FDA couldn't require stricter regulation of cosmetics and personal care products. That needs to happen through the passage of federal legislation. Senator Feinstein introduced a bill called the Personal Care Product Safety Act of 2015. With minimal regulation, companies are left to make their own decisions about potentially harmful ingredients. It requires the FDA to assess the safety of at least a minimum of five cosmetic chemicals a year. It would also give the FDA mandatory recall authority to get the unsafe products off of the shelves. It requires ingredient disclosure of both professional salon products as well as products sold through web-based sales. It also requires that companies report to the FDA any adverse effect related to the use of a personal care product or a cosmetic product. We support the creation of a national standard that maintains the continued safety of our products while providing the agency with the resources it needs. A number of companies have come forward now and have said, well, we're going to support the Feinstein legislation. And the reason they came forward, finally, was because they were seeing state agencies and state legislatures starting to take up legislation. Despite this long safety record, a, a comprehensive national program is needed to assure uniform regulations of cosmetics throughout the country and to prevent an unworkable patchwork of differing state requirements. The bill establishes a higher definition of safety, but that definition and that standard for safety only applies to the FDA, not to manufacturers. If the FDA is assessing five chemicals a year, it would take 20 lifetimes for them to get through the 10,000 chemicals used to formulate the cosmetics and personal care products we use every day. The Feinstein legislation says to cosmetic manufacturers, you need to substantiate the safety of, of cosmetic chemicals, but it doesn't give them a definition of safety that they should be adhering to. At the same time, the bill allows the secret chemicals in fragrance to remain undisclosed to consumers and manufacturers and even the FDA. There are brands out there that now have very strict chemical selection practices, whether it's method or a seventh generation. They still don't eliminate everything that consumers care about, but they do a really good job of basically producing a product that's gonna pass most of these NGO or market screens. The larger national brands, the Unilevers or the Johnson & Johnsons or the Procter & Gamble's believe that they have very strong safety and product stewardship programs and that consumers are basically misguided. 
something on the order of 80% of the chemicals out there really haven't even been subjected to a broad enough battery of animal tests for us to really be confident that we understand their full hazard profile. So most chemicals are inadequately tested. That means that we're operating in a world of essentially extensive toxic ignorance. Regulation can't proceed because the data level of evidence it needs is not available. Market regulation will proceed because there's a lot of risk associated with that amount of uncertainty and ignorance. Consumers, when told that there's a chemical that might be a carcinogen in a product, aren't really going to want to put it on their kids. They're really not going to want to wait around for the science to be settled on that. And that's not an unreasonable position for consumers to take. There's an issue called regrettable substitution, where manufacturers take out one toxic chemical because of consumer concern um, and replace that toxic chemical with an, with an equally or more toxic chemical. Paramins are a great example of a family of chemicals that got a lot of public attention because of a few scientific studies. Because consumers started screaming bloody murder, companies started taking them out. Phthalate metabolites are turning up everywhere and they're starting to be associated with adverse human health effects. Seems to be the same kind of situation as going on now with parabens, where some are better or worse than others, all of them have some degree of endocrine disrupting capabilities, some of them have a pretty high weight of evidence that they're problematic chemicals. The kind of chemical of the month hysteria that sometimes sweeps consumer markets, it works in a way because those consumers let Producers know they don't want any of these chemicals, but it seems very haphazard which chemicals get prioritized. It has no mechanism for controlling the risks associated with substitutes. When you move from one of these chemicals to an alternative ingredient that gives you the same functional benefit, that you have really gotten out of the frying pan. You might have just moved to an untested chemical that in five years is gonna be, you know, whatever, the next endocrine disruptor. I'm an assistant professor of environmental occupational health at George Washington University. My research is focused on understanding the public health consequences of industrial chemical use through examination of population health studies. Phthalates are one source of industrial chemicals widely used in consumer products. Phthalates are a class of chemicals. And within that class, there are high molecular weight phthalates commonly used as plasticizers. Low molecular phthalates such as DEP and DBP are more commonly found in personal care products in 2009 based on CDC and Haines data. We analyzed phthalate data on over 10,000 Americans over a 10 year period during the study period. DBP decreased over time. But we found parallel increases in DIBP, DBP, or dibutyl phthalate, and DIBP, or diisobutyl phthalate. They're structurally similar to each other. What may be going on there is shifts that have happened in the personal care product domain uh, driven by parallel advocacy efforts. One of the bad actors from these such campaigns has been dibutyl phthalate. Manufacturers have tried to steer away from those bad actors, but often they end up substituting them with structurally similar chemicals. There is evidence that they can affect the same biological pathways. The National Academy of Sciences highlights that DIBP is antiandrogenic just like DBP. So until we address broader issues around regulation, we're gonna be forced to deal with the regrettable substitute problem on a chemical by chemical basis. Oh,
agreeable to turn you next to the I think for most, most people living today, I mean, soap is anything that cleans you. Many consumers have certain expectations that their liquid soap should be this thick, goopy, neon pink stuff. Soap is a funny commodity. There are very few of them that are currently made anymore. Products such as soap bars or beauty bars that we think about and we see fairly frequently, those are really not true soaps because they're actually made from synthetic material. Under the act itself, when a cosmetic is defined, soap is excluded. To be a true soap, the non-volatile portion of the matter is made up of the alkaline metal salt of a fatty acid. Dr. Brown is a family soap making business since 1948, but we've been making soap for five generations going back to 1858. Quality soap making comes down to the choice of what kind of oils you use and what combination. We use coconut oil, olive oil, hemp and jojoba oils. We use, of course, alkali to turn those oils into soap. The glycerin from the oils is left in. Fragrance essential oils, like peppermint oil. Add some vitamin E to keep it from going rancid. Uh, a little bit of citric acid to make sure you have the mildest soap possible. The best preservative for our soaps is the soap itself. Because we can make a soap that is 39% concentrated, it's essentially self-preserving. If you use our products over the course of a month, you might get a little soap scum. That's, a, that's the residue from the soap that you know, doesn't stick to your body or anything, but you know, can, can stick to the surface of your drains. Number two, natural soaps are not tear-free. It's just kind of the nature of soaps. And if you get some in your eye, it's gonna sting a little bit. Obviously, chemistry can make certain improvements to certain functions. Certain chemicals can solve one problem, but they can create another. Like no tier formulas, I mean, they use more rigorous chemistry with more byproducts uh, involved that uh, can make a product that doesn't irritate the eyes. Now, you, you know, you get the compromise, right? Okay, it doesn't irritate the eyes, but at the same time, you know, what's it putting in your babies? Put them in the soap. Put them in the soap. Detergents are much more complicated cleansing agents. The simplest detergent, the simplest, uh, you know, non-soap surfactant is sodium lauryl sulfate. Sodium lauryl sulfate is an aggressive uh, anionic surfactant. It's you know more aggressive cleanser. It works extremely well in hard water. But as far as cleaning the body, the problem is it can be defatting on skin. What are you gonna do with those bubbles? You gonna wash your cheeks? I mean, all the function in the world that that using chemicals buys you pales in comparison to the f number one reason people use these chemicals. They're dirt cheap. <laughs> it's very easy to use just a little bit of detergent and then you use what's called a viscosity builder to make it all nice and thick. And you can get away with, you know, using a cheap amount of detergent and kind of make it look like it's concentrated by thickening it up. Even in minute amounts your skin absorbs. So it is one thing to take a shower and be like, wow, that, that was great, no residue, and that had a lot of bubbles, but you're not just using one product. I'm gonna put some on mommy. Thank you. <laughs> so you, you would consider the CIR doesn't determine whether long-term exposure to something uh, it constitutes a, uh, you know, a hazard. Yes, we do. We do uh, report on the epidemiology and the case reports. We do look at long-time human exposure as reported in the literature and by the industry, with the exception that we are dealing with the ingredient safety itself, the chemical safety of that ingredient, and not the whole product. We do make sure that there's a large margin of safety for exposure and realizing that the cosmetic ingredient is, is a one small chemical within a product that may have 20 ingredients, all which affect that one ingredient as well.
field of public health is really good at studying one exposure and its effects on one health outcome. However, we're just beginning to really understand how to study the health effects of chemical mixtures or the chemical soup. Personal care products are an important route of exposure. It's one that people have control over, but I think it's really important to realize you're exposed to chemicals in multiple ways. Some of these other pathways can be really substantial and are even harder to control. To really reduce these exposures, it's going to take broader changes at the policy level. We need a safety system that cracks down on chemical use in a safer and safer direction instead of what we've been doing now. You take the decision making out of the hands of the individual brand formulators, basically a set of qualified materials which are, you know, only these materials are going to be how you get foam because all of them don't come with any of this, you know, adverse health overhead or risk overhead. The good news is there are choices that you can make that can significantly lower the number of exposures you have to hazardous ingredients. You can brush your teeth, you can wear deodorant, you can, you can feel good about yourself uh, without having to give up these products altogether. You can use cleaner ones. specialize in making natural and organic skincare products using tallow. Tallow is essentially rendered beef fat. It's very nutrient dense, it's super healing, it's high in vitamins A, D, K, and E. We have an all natural mineral salt deodorant. We've been around since 1984. This is potassium alum. It's actually been used for hundreds of years in Southeast Asia where, where they use it in a powder form and also use it as a deodorant. This is a non-toxic nail polish. I was painting my daughter's nails over a foam plate like this, it dropped on, bubbled, and I just got concerned about the chemicals. And with little kids, hands always end up in the mouth, sucking on their thumbs, so, you know, ingesting all the chemicals in traditional nail polish. We choose really simple formulations so that we don't have to get into any of the chemical uh, stabilizers, emulsifiers, or preservatives. And when you make simple products that kind of are self-preserving because they have no water in them, you get to stay away from stuff that uh, is questionable or doesn't have enough studies to back up its safe use. Our baby butter contains seven ingredients. Tallow from organic grass-fed cows, coconut oil, shea butter, olive oil, avocado oil, jojoba oil, and beeswax. Completely unscented, completely natural ingredients. We use no preservatives in any of our products. They're either preserved um, naturally in the fact that there's no water in the formulation, or we include ingredients like raw apple cider vinegar that are natural preservatives. We tell people to use the product within six months of opening. We go to the grocery store every week to buy new produce and new food. We're using a lot of products that have a three-year shelf life sometimes. Those products that have really long shelf lives are able to do that because they're using a lot of preservatives and chemicals. You know, we're always trying to find a way in which we can take a category and make it natural and organic and, and kind of, you know, elevate it to our principles, but just kind of, you know, looking at all these, you know, kind of cheap, easy ways that, you know, mainstream body care used to accomplish a certain function, try to find something in nature that can do it even better. You know, with toothpaste, it meant coconut flour, and that gives mild, fine grit that's good for polishing the teeth. I buy fragrance-free products because fragrance it doesn't have any utility, so it's not making your product better. All of our products are only fragranced with organic essential oils. It's a little bit more expensive than the fragrance oils that you can find, but it comes directly from the plant. That's just, to us, seems like the obvious choice. If you want a wonderful fragrance, you go to the plant. The less number of products that you can use is probably better because, right, you know, just think back to that chemical soup effect. Look at the products you have in your medicine cabinet or in your shower and ask, do I really need this product? In cases where you can do without a product or just go back to basic soap, we certainly recommend it. You know, sunscreen is one where we have taken kind of uh, an organic balm, which is just oils and waxes, and added the natural minerals and oxide in it. 
to make a really safe and simple sunscreen without having to get into any of the chemicals that you find in other sunscreen products. There's a spectrum of adverse health effects associated with these exposures, and even if you go down to the allergic reactions or skin sensitization reactions, even those kind of low-level impacts uh, are rarely outweighed by the benefits of a product, right? We are really talking about, you know, the quality, of, you know, whether, whether the shampoo is foamy or not. Customers have become so accustomed to this like perfection when it comes to skincare products, but our products are not like that. Because when you're using natural ingredients, you're always gonna have a little bit of fluctuation and variation because that's how nature is. It's not always the same. It's not always super perfect. Consumers need to become smarter shoppers. But at the end of the day, consumers can't shop their way out of this problem. We need a government that protects everyone. And in order to get there, we need stricter government regulation of the cosmetics and personal care products we use every day. There are safer alternatives for most of the toxic chemicals being used to formulate cosmetics and personal care products. Like if we can take a precautionary approach if, if we can replace a toxic chemical with a safer alternative, why wouldn't we? One of our first products was our Stank Stop Natural Deodorant. It's a cream-based deodorant, so it comes in a pot and you're gonna put it on your finger and you just rub it into your armpit. Not weird at all. It's not full of a bunch of weird toxic chemicals. Coconut oil, arrowroot powder, shea butter, tallow from organic grass-fed cows baking soda, non-nano zinc oxide, beeswax, cypress essential oil, scotch pine essential oil, and coriander essential oil. We like to know that customers can pick up a jar and turn it around and know everything that they're putting onto their body and feel really comfortable and confident about it. I was definitely a secret girl before I started making my own stuff. Um, it worked, but who knows what it was doing to my body. I think it's great that somebody could take this and recreate it in their kitchen. I mean, if you have the time and have the energy to make your own products, I think that's awesome. No one should be forced to use chemicals on their skin every day. These products should be available to everyone. Thank mm -hmm. you.